This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu. Begins with a New Yorker cartoon. There, a woman frostily informs her obviously skeptical husband, yes, Harold, I do speak for all women. <laughs> this is not a claim any contemporary feminist will readily make. Women don't speak with one voice on women's issues. But to build a powerful political movement, we have to be prepared to generalize about the interests of women as a group. What would most women want if they were fully informed and free to choose and the goal was true equality between the sexes. What Women Want seeks to jumpstart a conversation about that agenda by surveying leaders of women's organizations and synthesizing a broad array of research on what holds women back. So what are the issues that should motivate women to seek change? And I'll start with employment. <coughs> the labor force remains highly gender segregated and gender stratified with women still overrepresented at the bottom and underrepresented at the top. As we approach the 50th anniversary of equal pay legislation, we're a considerable distance from accomplishing its promise. Full-time female workers' annual earnings are 77% of men's, a gap that hasn't substantially changed since 2001. And at current rates of change, it would take another half century to achieve equal pay rates for full-time workers. One reason for the gender gap is that women are clustered in lower earning occupations and lower paying sectors within occupations. So for example, in my own profession, law, women are 86% of paralegals, but only 16% of the partners at major law firms. In academia, women are half of college graduates, but only a quarter of full professors and university presidents. In management, women are a third of MBA graduates, but less than 4% of Fortune 1000 CEOs. And at current rates of change, it would take two and a half centuries to achieve parity in the executive suite. Part of the problem is that women also spend over twice as much time on care of children and over three, much, three times as much time on household tasks as men. Yet as Gloria Steinem once famously noted, women will never be equal outside the home until men are equal inside it. <laughs> so too, sexual violence remains common and reproductive rights are by no means secure. About one in four women have experienced domestic violence and almost one in five women an attempted or completed rape. We have the highest rate of domestic violence and the second highest rate of reported rape in the developed world. Over 85% of counties have no abortion providers, and a third to a fifth of poor women can't obtain abortions that they desire. We can and we must do better, and what women want sets forth a comprehensive agenda for change. It also includes overviews of interviews with leading women's rights organizations about the barriers to progress and the strategies for addressing them. Many leaders expressed frustration with what I've called the no problem problem, the widespread belief that women are moving up, barriers have coming down, and any lingering gender disparities are the result of women's different choices and capabilities. Another frustration among women leaders is that even women who have concerns about gender equity express so little inclination to address them. If no dictionary definition of the term feminism is given, only a quarter to a third of women identify as feminists and many see responsibility for addressing these problems to lie everywhere and anywhere else. We urgently need more attention to issues of gender inequality and more women in leadership positions that can address them. Women are over half the voting public, but they only constitute 18% of Congress, 10% of governors, and 12% of the mayors of the largest American cities. Given current rates of change, it would take close to a century to equal women's represent and men's representation in Congress. From a global perspective, we rank 78th in the world for women's representation in political offices, just below Tajikistan, Slovakia, Bangladesh, and Saudi Arabia. <laughs> this is, of course, a problem because women politicians are more likely than men to make women's issues a priority. 
But of course, it matters who the women are. As examples like Sarah Palin remind us, putting women in positions of power is not the same as empowering women. <laughs> we also need men who support women. And one of my other favorite New Yorker cartoons features a boardroom with about a dozen men seated around the table and one woman. And the chair of the meeting looks out at her and says, that's a great point, Miss Teague. Now let's just wait till one of the men makes it. <laughs> <laughs> to change that dynamic, women must target their voices and votes and dollars at political candidates, both male and female, who are willing to advance women's interests. We also need a strong women's movement that can help create political support for these initiatives. Over a century ago, newspaper editor William Allen White advised women to raise more hell and fewer dahlias, and that remains good advice. <laughs> this program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu.